Transfer portal open for football. We'll talk a little bit football later on in this podcast, but we're going to start at the top with the two big additions for JMU men's basketball. One of them being a six, seven rising sophomore forward for Moorhead state, Eddie Ricks, the third JMU also adds a six, six junior guard from Syracuse, Justin Taylor. We'll break down Eddie Ricks first, go into some Justin Taylor, and then kind of talk overall roster construction and what we think Preston Spradlin will do as time moves on. But first reaction to seeing Eddie Ricks join the Dukes from the portal. Yeah, so we're dorks. I think a lot of people listening are dorks, so kind of had this on our radar, right? Because he's a Moorhead State player that was in the portal. Really talented. He's a good defender. He led them in blocks as a forward, which I thought was impressive because they did have a true big uh, 39 seven block. footer. Yeah, they had a seven footer that was not Eddie Ricks. So Ricks had 39 blocks, good defender. I think he averaged seven and a half points a game, decent score. Rebounds were right around five. A solid player, not the most lethal scorer through one season, but definitely has some offensive game, but probably didn't do enough at Moorhead State to command a lot of like P5 offers. But he, it's really well with Preston Spradlin having played for him and and being a really good defender, which is kind of what Spradlin seems to care the most about. Yeah, you mentioned it. Not a great shooter. 41.6% from the floor, 30.6% from behind the arc, 61% from the free throw line, did average about five rebounds per game. So that's kind of what his role is. He played primarily the four for Preston Spradlin this past season, and he was kind of a day one impact player for Moorhead State, getting a lot of minutes, 27 minutes in the very first game that he appeared in. And, and really, that was kind of his MO for the remainder of the year. He scored in double digits 10 times, a season high of 21. Uh, I mean, but like you said, he, he is kind of more of a defensive player. He's going to alter shots. Think Justin Absin, but maybe not as elite. He was 263rd in the nation in block percentage getting a block on 4% of opponents' offensive possessions. I'm excited about the addition. I also think getting a guy who's only played one season of college basketball, his potential feels really high, right? He's a really good defender. He showed some moves. If you go watch some like his highlight tapes, he does have offensive moves and seems confident shooting the three. Um, Jamie's had plenty of guys who are confident shooting the three that don't make a ton, but I think there's potential there for him to, to make more threes, to be a bigger offensive threat. But the main thing, and I think this is the big thing. You got to keep the main thing, the main thing. You got to keep the main thing, the main thing. You got to keep the standard, the standard. I think my guess would be Preston Spradlin would like JMU to be the most efficient defense in the Sun Belt. And that's like priority number one. And I think Rick's is going to help with that. Yeah. Both of the moves in the portal today show that we, we can jump to Justin Taylor and then kind of hop between both of them because they added Justin Taylor as I'm trying to find the correct lower third. He's a 6'6 junior guard from Syracuse, was the second best defender on the Orange this past season, according to Evan Maya. Offensively, he took a, a pretty huge step back from his freshman year to his sophomore year. Could that be because he played an entirely new position under an entirely new coaching staff? Probably. But it is a little stark that he had such a big jump backwards but he is a very good defensive player. Yeah, he came out of, of high school, and I guess he finished. He was in Charlottesville for a little bit, but then finished at IMG Academy and was known, I think, like as a shooter, a three-point shooter. His freshman year at Syracuse, he was 39% from three and looked like a really confident shooter. Struggled a lot more this year. I think he was sub-30% from three, at least against D1 teams. He was 30.1% from three on the entire season. So he had a he had a good one against a <laughs> non D one that uh, Ken probably he did yeah he was two of five against Shamanad in Maui so that's you love to see that but he started every game this year for Syracuse I think largely because of what he can do defensively so you've added another piece that can defend you've got Xavier Brown presumably probably a starting point guard or at least getting a lot of minutes at point guard. That's a pretty good defensive like trio right there. And you certainly Quincy Allen's got some athleticism. We'll see if Roberson develops and, and gets minutes in the front quarter, if they add other guys in the portal, but they have potential there and we still don't know what's happening. Like if they get Raekwon Horton back, they have like the best defensive group of wings that you could possibly imagine. Yeah. Sideline said Rick's 
very active player matchup problem for guards and wings. If he can drop, if he can get his shot to drop at a more consistent clip, a huge matchup problem. I, I, I kind of picture him more in that Raquan Horton mold where if he can get that shot where it's like around a 33, 34% shooter, which is what Raquan was this last year. It, it makes people kind of have to respect you step out a little bit more and defend you a little harder. But these are two pickups that are going to play that three, that four spot. They're filling it out really well. I think Ricks will probably slot in as the four. Taylor will probably slot in as the three. Xavier Brown will be the one or the two, depending on who they pick up in the portal. Mark Freeman might be coming the 2023 OVC player of the year. Um, we can talk about that too. But I think Taylor has a lot. Ricks has a lot of potential. But am I crazy in thinking that Taylor might have more potential? No, he was a four-star recruit coming out of high school, like super talented. If he gets the jump shot back, given his size, ability to defend, things like that. I mean, he was he was playing a ton for Syracuse, which got itself like toward the bubble at the end of the year. I mean, they beat North Carolina in mid-February and he played 21 minutes for him. Like that that he's feels also, valuable. He's also a six six guard, listed as a six six guard, playing the four. And he's like six six two twenty. Yeah, like yeah. this dude is going to be a matchup nightmare in the Sun Belt. If he can shoot anywhere close to his freshman year number of 39%, heck, if it's a 36% three-point mm -hmm. shooter, but like he's good inside, he may be an offensive juggernaut in the in the Sun Belt because there's just not a lot of guys that can match up with a 6 6 two, 20 guard forward high. It's almost like Terrence Edwards, but a little bigger in terms yeah, of weight. And you're going to play slower, right? Offensively, they seem to go slower in with, in theory, with Spradlin. Syracuse went pretty quick or at least decently fast. I think that could be a benefit to him if they're really selective in their shots, if his three-point attempts are coming like fully set and they're they're drawing up stuff specifically for him, it could boost that percentage too. So I kind of think they're building a roster that does make sense to go a little bit slower, um, which is going to be a change. But I, I don't know. Defensively, they look like they'll be good. And then we've got it here on our lower third, but his mom played uh, women's basketball at JMU. I think there is something to be said for him, like just wanting to be close to home and probably enjoying being at JMU, which is cool. Yeah. And JMU was one of the first, if not the first, depending on how 247 puts in their offers. Three offers came in on June 12th of 2020, according to 247. First was from JMU. So I'll say JMU was one of the first schools to offer him. June 12th of 2020, that may have been Byington's first recruiting class. So one of the first guys that Byington reached out to and in terms of that recruiting class. And like you said, his mom played at JMU. Mom is now a, a practicing lawyer in Charlottesville. That's where he grew up. It seems that he may have, and I, not to project too much, but like it seems like he may have had maybe a rough sophomore year with a new coach playing a position that wasn't necessarily his true position he played more of the three in high school according to 247 so you come back home try to fix your shot get a year or two under your belt maybe you jump back up to the p5 or you finish out your collegiate career as a kind of jmu potential great player the upside feels crazy with him right we're like i think like your your floor is probably like really good defender who can play a bunch of minutes which is what he did at syracuse and then the ceiling would be if he gets the three-point shot back, you're looking at somebody who's a really good defender, who starts on the wing, who like has local ties and just shoots the crap out of it from three. <laughs> I mean, his floor, I mean, his floor <laughs> and his ceiling are both super exciting. I don't know. That feels like one that I I know people mentioned it, like, oh, he's a local kid. He didn't have a great year at Syracuse in the portal. And yeah. I was like, I don't know. Like, oh, <laughs> I like the idea. I just didn't think it was like realistic. I yeah. thought he would want to play at a – a place that was bad. I honestly thought he had a like UVA might look into him. Um, so to get him at, at J UVA so. did offer him back out of high school. So they may have even looked into him, but Preston Spradlin may have given him the pitch. You might be our offensive guy. If we don't get Mark Freeman, you <laughs> might be the guy. He's got a chance to be the guy for sure. Or at least like one of the top two guys because of how much they lost. I don't know. I'm starting to like the, the portal class. Now they've got a lot of needs left. A lot of needs left. What was, Good what was segue. That? It was a Sycamore Mango Chronic. If you're in the uh, Charlotte, North Carolina area, I highly recommend 
That sounds pretty good. Um, I also recommend Three Notch Beer if you're in the Virginia area. That well said. Great segue into this part of the podcast. They've lost a lot. They still have seven scholarships to hand out. Mark Freeman did drop a little bit of an interesting, maybe I'm reading too much into it. I might be, I very well could be, but Mark Freeman reposted Eddie Ricks on Instagram with the caption copy handshake at Eddie Ricks. (laughs) That's right. After he announced his transfer. So maybe Mark Freeman's on his way and he's a bucket. He's a bucket getter. I think that one. App State Cone Enforcer agrees with Sycamore. Mango Chronic is a great brew. Yeah, I think uh, well, that's well said. But I also I also think Mark Freeman would be a, a huge pickup because he's a guy who shoots a lot from three. His last year at Moorhead State, he was injured this, this past season. But before that, 37%. The year before that at Illinois State, 37% from three, at least against D1 teams. Big time score. He's small at 5'11, but he can fill it up. For a team that seems like is adding good defender, good defender, good defender, having somebody that could fill it up would be good. Yeah, I would. I would. If Mark Freeman came, I would get way too excited about this team, even with six scholarships. That's remaining. what's so exciting, right? I let myself do this. I remember when when this whole transfer process started. I went, I'm not gonna, let, I'm not gonna let myself buy in too much. They hired Preston Sprad. Then I think my first text to you was, I'm not blown away. And then I researched him more and more, and I was like, I'm so excited. And then I saw the transfers leave, and Jalen Carey goes to Vanderbilt. Terrence Edwards goes to Louisville. We all knew he was leaving, but, like, you see these things start to come in. And I was like, okay, they're going to add really good guys on paper that I'm going to be able to talk myself into. I'm not going to let myself get too excited. Here we are, two transfers in, and I'm like, if they can add Mark Freeman, this team's winning the national championship. They're going to be a scrappy mid-major, like at, at minimum. They're already building like a core, a core that's better than like, I mean, they had some teams like in the Matt Brady era and maybe even the Lou Rowe era that like this. One, oh, oh, <laughs> I'm telling you, I think Mark Freeman. <laughs> Mark Freeman. I think it's Mark Freeman. <laughs> copy. I'm, I'm going on record. Mark Freeman is going to be the next transfer portal uh, to come through. I think that gets you a lot then because you've got, that's a dangerous backcourt with Freeman and Brown. You then got Ricks or Drew Taylor. Thelwell. I know he's going to Miami, that's true. UCF, that's true. Wake Forest, all of these teams yeah. that have basketball huge... schools, right? <laughs> schools that can't compete both on the gridiron and in the hardwood. Yeah. Um, I forgot what I was saying. Oh, you know what they still need though, even if they do add Mark Freeman? We're back. We're back like two years in the past. Dukes need a big. <laughs> they they have Jerrell Roberson. Okay. Quincy Allen. He's not a big. He's a wing. Yeah. Who do you who do you who do you play at the four or five or at the five right now? Is there like a seven footer who went to IMG Academy who was at a- like a P5, it didn't work out, but they have like you say the ties. recent transfer portal edition. No, Tulsa's big man, he's a seven footer, just entered the portal like two hours ago. Is he close? Does he have no. JMU ties? No, not at all. <laughs> and I'm pretty sure he's like, in contact <laughs> that's, that's what I always do. I'll go on like evanmaya.com or something and look through the portal because it's got like the whole list. And I'm just like looking at random bigs. I'm like, yo this guy at Cornell could be the dude. And then he will commit to like Virginia tech. I was like, well, that was a waste of my time. <laughs> I'm <laughs> going to look, look, I'm gonna look now. <laughs> Let's see. Portal rankings. Is that where I go? Oh, I got to subscribe. Yeah. You subscribe subscri- to- I subscribe, subscribe? To as well. Yeah. It's worth it for the portal stuff. I think I can't okay, remember. Se- the- send me your login after this. Yeah, <laughs> I will. I'll play Maybe around I- with it. Yeah, but you can but go they, like by position and stuff. It's fun. that's what I was gonna. I was gonna do that live on the podcast and just start naming names. But in all honesty, back to back on the back on the rails here. Um, they definitely need a big still. They need guard depth, and at this point, they kind of just need overall depth because as it stands mm-hmm. right now, they're starting five. If the season started tomorrow, Xavier Brown. Why did I just completely blank? Xavier Brown, the two would be. 
I think we went like super small in our projected one on the internet and we had like Taylor at the two. I did do that, didn't I? It was like Taylor Allen Rex or Rex Allen. That's right. To get all the scholarships yeah. on the court. Yeah, I went yeah. Xavier, Justin Taylor, Eddie Ricks, uh, Quincy Allen, Joel Roberson. And then the bench would be Red Thompson, the freshman who just recommitted. Recommitted, yeah. Uh, McKeon, Fett, Feeden, and Pope. Those and last those three are the walk-ons. Walk-ons, yeah. They got a lot of scholarships left. So every D1 school gets 13 scholarships. They have seven remaining to hand out. A lot. Now, you don't have to give out all of your scholarships. But it would be kind of foolish not to. You'll at least get close. Like, sometimes they'll leave one or two for walk-ons that have, like, worked hard if you want to go with, like, an eight-man rotation or something. Which is the other thing. I think we've gotten used to Mark Byington running out, like, 11 for the first yeah, month that's a very season. good point. Spradlin might actually like do what most college coaches do and have like an eight or nine man rotation. I think that's probably more realistic than the uh, the Mark Byington ten that then gets kind of compressed to eight or nine, but he'll still like throw the tenth guy in sometimes. My guess is that Spradlin's got himself a tighter tighter group, group especially yeah. if you're not paying, playing that fast. Agreed. I, I'm su- I'm excited for this team though. I, I think. Whoever comes in next, Mark Freeman or another guy or a few bigs, this team has the potential to to really make some noise in the Sun Belt again. I mean, you hire a guy who seems like he can really coach, and now you start to have all these good portal ads. Jeff Bourne and company, you've done it again. Not to kind of to veer off in a different direction here after shouting out Jeff Bourne, by all means. <laughs> Were you shocked to see Justin Taylor come in? Because I was expecting Division II, NAIA, low major guys just to come through the pool, guys I had never heard of. And then when I saw a Syracuse transfer, a, a Syracuse starter who was in the portal come to JMU, and I understand all of his local ties, but that, that still took me by surprise. It gives off, obviously, different position, like the Bickerstaff vibes. It where it's like, I was oh, thinking this- that. I was thinking that an ACC guy coming to the Sun Belt to just beat up on him. It kind of, yeah, it's like that where bigger staff, like his ACC stats weren't crazy. And you're like, oh, that guy's going to eat in the Sun Belt. <laughs> That's kind of <laughs> how I feel about Taylor. It's like, it's just, it's a significantly lower competition level than the ACC. Like he should be able to do a lot, both offensively and defensively. I think he's going to regress positively to the mean be a solid three point shooter, play the three and just be like a really good player. Yeah. That one. I, I'm ex- <laughs> I'm super excited for him. Like I, when he first get it, when he first committed and I had just seen his, I just saw his like sophomore year stats. I was like, this guy, what are we doing? A defensive menace. Come on. That's all he does. And then I was looking at his splits and I was like, Oh, this dude's legit. Yeah, and I think with with Spradlin, I guess I've I've maybe even been doing him um, a little bit unfair with sort of describing. I do think he's prioritizing defense for sure, but like Morehead State was actually a little bit more efficient offensively than defensively. They were 123rd offensively, 129th defensively. I don't know. They could just be really good on both ends. I think they might be very good. I guess the the concern I have, I'm curious your thoughts here. Last year, there was some returning core, Edwards yeah. specifically, and Friedel and Wooden, who were all just massive pieces in the And Brown Xavier. Had, yeah, he was a big piece as well. It's going to be, it seems like at least, right, a very really transfer-heavy rotation, so they won't have played together a ton. You might have multiple Moorhead State players based on some of the, the Instagram activity you're monitoring. Um, so maybe some chemistry there. But is, I don't know, is that going to be a challenge to kind of get it all to gel together? So I'm going to look up a stat while I'm trying to figure out this point. I'm going to throw a question back at you. Oh. Do you think it's almost not bad, but difficult that if they do bring over Mark Freeman and they have Eddie Ricks and they have their former coach, that then that core that is there, the Xavier Brown, the Jarrell Roberson and Quincy Allen, they feel almost like this is our team, but now we're almost outnumbered by the other team. 
I don't think so. Does that does I, that thought process make sense, or am I just like saying you, something? It, they definitely have to? It has to be one where like you got to get them to gel off the court, right? So that you have sort of agreement on what's going on. But I think with the portal, it makes it easier because I guess in years past, if you didn't have the portal, you could just wallow sort of on your team and be frustrated that you have a new coach and and well, I guess you wouldn't have different players, but you could have some different players. Maybe they're a grad transfer. I think in this case, like Brown deciding to stay means he's bought into what Spradlin is doing. And then I don't know that Allen and Roberson were like, they didn't necessarily play a ton. So I think for them, I imagine they'd be down for whatever the new coach is offering because it'll give them a chance possibly to play. I think it definitely fits Roberson's style a little more. I think he would make sense and sort of a slow it down, be deliberate with what you're doing. So I think there are actually a lot of benefits to it. I also think Brown specifically seems like he's very coachable and not a huge ego and sort of almost becoming like the face of the team yeah. where I think he'd be down to like share the spotlight with people. Cause he did that a lot this year. I, I agree. I just kind of wanted to throw that back at you so you could cover while I was doing some math. I, I also think if you're looking at Xavier Brown's Instagram story, I was really all over social media today. He was showing a lot of love to Eddie Ricks and Taylor today, just like hyping them up, congratulating them, welcoming them into JMU essentially. So he, he is being that face of JMU. I think he's going to do a really good job of being the elder statesman of the team and helping kind of usher in this Bradlin era. As it stands right now, JMU returns 12.6% of their minutes from last year. They only had one guy who's returning this year play more than a hundred minutes. Xavier Brown, blah, 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 blah. Xavier Brown played 760 minutes last season. Next closest was Quincy Allen with 57 minutes played. Jarrell Roberson with 54. Shane Feeden, Jarrell Pope, and Aiden McKeon uh, played 23, 16, and 11, respectively. It says a lot about the blowouts at the walk-ons were logging some minutes. <laughs> Good sure. for them. Good for them, man. But they they really only return Xavier Brown. That's their only experience. In it's terms of like big moments, mm -hmm. big games, how you play the Sun Belt, how the games are officiated. There's I'm gonna say it now so that when I am inevitably upset when they're sitting at four games above 500 after blowing like three games early on in the season. I'm going to tell myself now that it's going to take some time for them to mesh together, that the start of Sunbelt play might be a little bit difficult, but I think they'll get it together and be really, I think they're going to be playing their best basketball as the season rolls on February, March, January, February, March, 2025 was when we're going to see this team really come together. Yeah, they've got a chance, too, with some of them, right? Where Brown, Taylor, Ricks, multiple years of eligibility. So, obviously, the portal's crazy where they could all leave again. But if you could keep them for, for two seasons, it would be, you know, phenomenal. Billy Matthews Jr. was Taylor and Xavier Brown recruit. He said he had some high-character guys in mind for transfers. I wouldn't be shocked if they knew of each other and they kind of had a pre-existing relationship. Uh, because Xavier Brown played his high school ball in the 757 area. Shane, it's Shane Taylor. Um, that is a second baseman for Charlotte. Justin Taylor. <laughs> Justin Taylor played his high school ball in Charlottesville. So they may have kind of crossed paths, maybe on the AAU circuit. I wouldn't say it was a necessarily an Xavier Brown recruit, but what Xavier posted on Instagram, I think they have a connection. I think they have a relationship. Yeah, I also think, too, you mentioned it. Danny was like Merriman, the sorry to interrupt you. X and Taylor played together at one point. Well, there you go. And Thank they, you, um, with the lack of returners and guys just sort of on campus, I, Taylor visited. I think when other transfers will visit, too, I imagine Brown is kind of in their ear at some point, in addition to the coaches. Clap. So, <laughs> yeah. But I think once you start to get some guys going, there is sort of with every team in the country, too. It's not a JMU exclusive. But you have like the the camaraderie and the idea of like, hey, if we can add a couple more transfers, I think there is that unselfishness of like we could win the Sun Belt again, play in an NCAA tournament, be really good in front of like rowdy home crowds. So yeah, I think they've got a chance to to really put together a stellar portal class. And I also think Preston Spradlin 
maybe did a little uh, underselling over delivering in his his intro press conference when he's like, yeah, I just look for these unheralded guys. <laughs> Like Justin Taylor, the ACC starter who was a four star, is your unheralded guy that you have? The, the 17th best player in Florida who played his <laughs> final year of high school ball at IMG. Yeah, the unheralded guy. That's like Zach Eady saying that he was unheralded coming out of IMG. Yeah, <laughs> very funny. But yeah, that, that's basketball. It's I'm a good portal hall so far. Good portal hall. Lots more to come, though. Seven yeah. more scholarships to hand out. Still need rim protection, bigs in general. Maybe they can get Mark Freeman and get kind of a guy that can put up points in a hurry, be lethal from the three-point line. But as it stands right now, they're getting an A from me. If they get Freeman and like a true, I'm, if they get Freeman, a true I don't, big. If they get Freeman, oh. I don't care what else they do. I will be so stupid on this podcast. <laughs>